Hello, everyone. I'm Jen Rogers. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, before we get started, I know everyone's just coming in. I want to remind you all that we want to hear from you. This is actually interactive. And when you chime in, it really helps us figure out where to go and what you want to know more about. So if you see the chat there, please put questions in. We've got a great guest and you're going to want to ask your own questions. Also take our poll, okay? Uh, so let's get started. I would like to welcome our guest this morning, President and CEO of Churchill Asset Management, Ken Kensell. Ken, it is so great to have you with us. Uh, let's start really big here. For those people that are less familiar with the space, what exactly is private credit? And can you describe its evolution? Because honestly, you've actually been there since the beginning. <laughs> well, thanks, Jen. And thank you all for, for joining us today. And I hope this will be interactive and an opportunity for folks to really get a better sense of what we do and, and how we do it. But um, you're right. I mean, I've been around in the business quite a while and, and have seen the evolution of, of private credit. And um, you know, it's been an interesting, you know, story and, and, and evolution, you know, over the years. And it really started with, you know, um, the, the fact that um, banks, you know, historically had been the, the leaders in providing, you know, uh, commercial loans and, and, and direct lending. And, and over the last 20, 25 years, that, that market has evolved to really be dominated by large scale institutional asset managers. And um, there are many flavors of direct lending and private credit. There are, you know, traditional, regular way corporate loans to, to mid-market companies. There are asset-based loans that are more, um, um, you know, based on the underlying collateral financing. Uh, there are more opportunistic credit strategies that really look to, to more, take advantage of more situational lending. Uh, but I would say certainly the largest portion of, of the direct lending market, which today is a 1.5, 1.6 trillion dollar market is really in that middle market, um, you know, corporate lending. And you know what we're talking about here, pure simply, is 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 loans to mid-sized U.S. businesses. Private equity tends to be a big portion. Private equity owners tend to be a big portion of the business. Probably 60, 70 percent uh, are companies that are owned or controlled by private equity firms. Uh, but it's been growing ra very rapidly. And that transition from the banks to the, the asset managers today is largely complete. If you look okay. at the largest direct lenders today, they are large scale institutional providers of, of capital. Uh, and we raise capital from uh, investors all over the world. I mean, Churchill, for example, today we have uh, over 600 institutional investors uh, you know, throughout the world that look at us as their access point to uh, getting opportunities to invest in, in mid-market uh, private credit. Yeah, explain a little bit more about Churchill's fit into the ecosystem right now, since there are so many different, you know, as you just laid out, players and levels here. Sure, um, and uh, I noticed that the golden age of private credit <laughs> flashed on the screen here, and I think in many respects it is. Um, but Churchill is uh, one of the largest direct lenders um, in the U.S. Uh, actually, back in March, we completed uh, the, the combination with Arcmont Asset Management. So collectively, we manage over $70 billion of, of private capital. Um, in the U.S. business, Churchill is uh, uh, our U.S. operation, and we manage about $50 billion in the U.S. market. And that's split roughly evenly between senior lending, which is you know, traditional bank-like middle market loans. Um, we do 100% of our lending to private equity owned companies. And then we have a junior capital and private equity investment team that focuses on mezzanine debt and junior debt uh, and debt below the, the bank level or below the senior debt, uh, as well as equity co-investment. So US business, Churchill flat platform, about 50 billion. 25 billion in, in, in senior direct lending and 25 billion in, in junior capital. We annually invest in the U.S. between 10 and 12 billion dollars, and we're investing in between three and 500 companies a year. We have a portfolio today of about 600 U.S. companies. So we are, in many respects, you know, a lender to the U.S. middle market, which I think people would be surprised to learn is actually one of the largest economies in the world on a standalone basis, just the U.S. middle market. So, you know, we think in many respects we're, we're funding and financing 
really the lifeblood of job creation and job growth and uh, investment activity, you know, in the U.S. I mean, when you dive into those numbers, obviously there is a lot of business right now. And I want to know that this golden age of private credit, is it, is this, I mean, is that an overstatement or is it really happening right now? Yeah. So if, if you think about kind of where the direct lending market has evolved and it's, you know, it's very interesting. What we see is that um, over the last um, decade, you know, direct lenders have been taking share relative to the syndicated loan market. Historically, once a company got to a certain size, they would, you know, we would congratulate them. We'd say, wonderful, you guys have gotten to 100, 150 million in cash flow. You're now able to issue a liquid loan in the broadly syndicated liquid loan market. And what has happened over the last several years is that direct lenders have gotten larger and we've been able to take share away from that syndicated loan market. And that's accelerated through the current environment. So with the broadly syndicated loan market largely closed to new issue, the direct lenders have really become the go-to source of financing for mid-market companies. In fact, the ratio of direct lending to syndicated lending today is at an all-time high of over 11 to 1. So 11 direct lending deals to only a single syndicated loan deal. So we've become the go-to source of financing for, you know, for um, increasingly larger companies. And, and so why is that? Well, if you think about it, would you rather have to go through a whole rating agency and syndication process and flexing of pricing and all the mechanics around that? Or would you rather make a phone call to one or two direct lenders who can provide a full solution to a company's financing needs. So speed, certainty of execution, uh, ongoing partnership with your lender have made direct lending really the go-to source of financing. So we've gained in popularity, but I would say that from a terms and investment standpoint, that's really where the, the difference is today. I mean, if you look today, at a typical mid-market senior loan that we would have done as a large scale direct lender two years ago, that loan would have earned between six and 8% floating rate, senior secured with traditional financial covenants. That loan today is earning 12%, obviously because of the increase in base rates and overall spreads, generally at lower leverage, better covenant protection, and, and, and with structures that involve more equity capital and overall larger companies. So in many respects, when you kind of check through the boxes, if you will, in terms of the current environment versus where we were even a couple of years ago, um, terms and conditions and investment opportunities are as good as we've, we've ever seen. Mm -hmm. So you know, I would say we are in many respects you know, in that golden age of, of private credit. But I think that you know, I think that historically that golden age had only really been in, having been enjoyed by the institutional and investors. And what's changed about the current environment is that more and more we're seeing individual investors, retail investors, high net worth investors saying, well, wait a minute, this, this middle market direct lending world has been proven with institutional investors. How can I get access to those products? Right. How can I get access to high quality direct lenders that deliver that kind of quality current income? And what's changed is we're seeing an increasing focus on the part of individual investors to, to, that are looking for that, that quality opportunity to invest in, in, in US private companies. I want to get into that and, and how we're seeing that change, uh, but we are getting some questions in the chat. I also want to remind people, please put some questions in. Um, we uh, thank you for your ones that are already there and make sure to take the poll. Uh, but just to sort of follow up on how we've seen this, um, this evolution change, we have a question from John Mullen saying, do you see the banks coming back into the space in the future? or will they continue to pull back? So, you know, you talked about this ratio and how it's yeah. changed so much. So is there any chance that that's gonna change? We, you know, actually, how long is no. it gonna and, stay like this? You know, actually, no, and well, what's happened is that, you know, you know, the banks exited for, for good reason from their perspective, right? They saw that the labor intensity of direct lending, 
uh, relative to maybe just being a syndicated distributor of loans, being in the moving business versus what I would argue, you know, we're really more in the storage business. You know, that, that really drove the banks to focus on larger deals, more capital uh, efficient utilization of, of their balance sheets. And so they moved out of direct lending. And in fact, what's happened over the last year, when you see what's going on with Silicon Valley Bank and with First Republic and, and some of the pressures they've seen from a deposit funding standpoint, it's actually accelerated the banks moving away from direct lending. In fact, in areas like asset-based lending and healthcare receivables finance, and, and frankly, even in areas like auto loans, I think what you're going to see is an increasing institutionalization of that marketplace where banks are simply looking at the kind of lending that we do and saying, you know, we need to be careful about our liquidity, right? I mean, deposit funding was thought of as a, you know, almost like a permanent funding base, right? Until Silicon Valley Bank happened, until First Republic happened. And so I think what you're seeing is regional banks starting to say, well, wait a minute, you know, we need to be careful about these, these senior secured middle market loans. They may be great loans and maybe have a great asset level, you know, credit profile and return, but they are illiquid, right? So, right. you know, when you need liquidity, if your deposits are moving, you know, you need to be careful about maintaining a certain level of liquidity. So I think if anything, the trend of banks exiting some of these direct lending areas will continue. In fact, um, you know, I mentioned um, in a, a conference uh, so a couple of weeks ago that we've actually seen regional banks start to think about selling their direct lending business, their, their kind of asset based lending businesses because of those concerns regarding liquidity. So, you know, there, there have been some research reports done that have speculated that not only is, is the regular way cash flow lending business having now moved to um, asset management uh, uh, firms, but also some of the more traditional asset based lending businesses are going to move away from the banks. Now, that being said, banks do lend to us, you know, so to right. the extent we utilize leverage in our CLOs or in our credit facilities and our funds, banks still remain lenders to lenders, if you will, right? So we still have very significant um, lending relationships with commercial banks. And so it's a partnership, right? The economics of lending to lenders actually works pretty well for banks. So, you know, you see banks like Wells Fargo and Bank of America and others as a lender to the you know, asset managers that provide financing. So they do play a role. They're in the ecosystem, but they're lenders to lenders. So I don't see the banks moving anytime soon back into the direct lending business. You've seen a few banks set up partnerships, if you will, with, mm -hmm. you know, with um, asset managers. I think you'll see some of that. But, okay. but overall, I think where banks will play is, is lender to lender or in going out to their asset management clients and offering our products to their clients. So they'll still be in the mix and they're important yep. partners, uh, but maybe in a different way. Well, thank you, John, for that question. I am, Ken, getting some of the uh, poll results here. Do your clients currently have exposure to private credit strategies? 42.9%, uh, so 43% said yes. We've got no from about 36%. And um, considering investment, 14%, not sure, 7%. So less than half saying yes here. And I think that brings me back wow. to where we were when we were talking about how it's changing and this democratization of alternatives. And it's become something that many more people are interested in. I think historically they thought, okay, this is not, this is not for me, right? This is a, a, a much further up. Uh, so how are financial advisors and their clients able to access these private sure. credit opportunities today? Sure. Well, probably the, the, the most significant way that, that advisors uh, are able to access, ultimately their clients are able to access, is through uh, publicly listed or, or publicly uh, traded uh, BDCs. Those, those, you know, BDC has become kind of the preferred uh, uh, structure for individual investors to, to access private credit. Now there are publicly traded BDCs, and then of course there are private list, uh, private listed and registered vehicles that are not yet publicly traded. They provide some liquidity in the form of quarterly uh, redemption dynamics, but whether they're publicly traded or, or uh, perpetually private, the BDC format 
is has become the preferred format to access private credit. And the nice thing about BDCs is that they're they're very much like a REIT for for du direct lending in the sense that they're a pass through vehicle from a tax perspective. They are a 1099 versus a K1, so they're relatively easy to own, and they provide an ongoing you know current income or current yield. And you've got you know uh, quite a few uh, direct lending platforms like ourselves sponsor uh, a BDC offering as part of their overall product, um, their overall product offering. And I would say BDCs have become probably the most common way for individual investors to, to access, um, you know, private credit or, or direct lending. And in terms of why they do it, I would tell you that as individual investors look at ways to diversify away from the public markets, um, generally private credit is less correlated to the public market. So uh, providing strong current income, less correlated to the public markets, floating rate. So all of our senior loans are floating rates. So you see that on our portfolio, which has gone from six to eight percent yield to, to now twelve percent for you know for our um, our our, uh, our loans at the asset level yield. So you know provide traditional financial covenants. So it's a way for investors to diversify away from public equities, but to do it you know with proven managers that have institutionally um, backed uh, platforms. You know, in our case, um, you know, we manage capital now between our U.S. and U.S. and European uh, uh, platforms for over 600 institutional investors globally. So uh, it's nice to be able to, to manage that capital for for individual investors as well. And I think individual investors are, are, are recognizing uh, that that there's role in a portfolio for allocating to to uh, to to private credit. And certainly there's been a tremendous amount of uh, of adoption there. Um, I want to, we have about four minutes left, uh, get another question here from the chat from um, Albert Souza saying that the market is approaching $2 trillion. Uh, Do you see defaults rising, especially if the economy slows? I know you talked about, you know, the stronger covenants that are in there. And what, what do you think, you know, to address some of the concerns that might be out there? Sure. Well, there's no question that, you know, going from a 6 or 7 or 8% uh, uh, interest expense, to to the twelve percent interest expense, uh, obviously, you know, is is increased interest burden on on the companies. I th I think what you'll see is that the more conservative direct lenders like ourselves, you know, will prove their metal, if you will. Uh, their portfolios will 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 tend to 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 weather the the higher interest burden better. Uh, and and I think this is a good you know, scenario where investors will be able to see. You know the more conservative direct lenders, you know who invested prudently, provided um, uh, good structures and under underwriting for you know the loans they made, and maybe some of the others who play be played on the more aggressive end of the spectrum. So I think it depends on the lender, um, and it depends on the posture they've taken and how they've approached investing. Um, but I would say that from our perspective, we're still seeing very good credit quality in our portfolios, good interest coverage. Overall, um, you know, uh, very, very comfortable with with what we're seeing. And of course, that's on our existing portfolios. Right. But when you're talking about new loans and new investments, those are being made in, in what I would argue is a bit of the golden age of private credit. Right. We're getting higher interest. You know, uh, uh, we're, we're underwriting those loans at generally lower leverage with better covenants. So certainly the new vintage, the vintage of loans that are being made today we believe are going to be uh, among the best we've seen in, in the history of direct lending. So here we are. Um, you're very optimistic about the space. We're looking ahead. Oh, I mean, it's hard to believe it's almost the end of 2023. So what yeah. do you think FAs joining us today should be thinking about? Because it does seem like a lot of people are interested in this space. People are evaluating how yes. to get in in some cases. What should they be thinking about? I think they should be looking as they think about the space they should be looking at proven managers with significant scale and institutional support, right? Because the, the reality today is, if you look at our world, there are five to 10 firms that are seeing the lion's share of the quality deal flow. Because we've been there for, in some cases, as much as 15 or 20 years doing it. We have established relationships with the private equity community, which is the largest portion of, uh, of the direct lending space. 
and we've got a proven track record of delivering those returns. So stick with the proven names. Stick with firms that have scale, that have been raising institutional capital, that have been validated by the large scale pension plans and insurance companies. Um, and frankly, I would argue that private equity owned companies, you know, direct lenders that focus on private equity are, are fundamentally a more conservative place to, to invest. Why? The typical equity contribution in our transactions last quarter is an example, 65% equity, right? So we're, we're financing companies that are being backed by private equity firms that have a strong track record, that exercise governance and oversight, that invest significant capital below the loans that we make, that are there to make changes in management or changes in strategy right. to the extent there are challenges in the business. So I would say stick with proven managers, stick with managers that have been doing it a long time, that have significant scale, that have real relationships in terms of where they're investing, their portfolios are performing well. And I would say overall firms that um, are focused on private equity where they know they're getting uh, the, the, the support and the, the backing of leading investment firms in the industry. Uh, Ken, thank you so much. That's all the time we have for today. I could keep talking about this. Thank you to everybody for your questions and for taking the poll. Again, Ken Kinsell of Churchill Asset Management. Thank you so much. And thanks to Naveen. <music>